Again, welcome, and I'm so glad to see lots of family here today, and uh, it is always good to have the opportunity to get together in the house of the Lord on a hot Sabbath like this. And I, I do, I want to give a shout out to, to Paul uh, and, and others who helped to make our electric bill a little less at this time. Uh, if you don't know, this entire side of our roof is covered with solar panels. So, uh, yes, amen. amen. So if you contributed a moment ago to church budget, it's being stretched very, very nicely with uh, the use of our solar panels and uh, helps us to be nice and cool. Except for me, of course, because I have these 500-watt lights uh, uh, shining at me right now. We're going to spend a, a few moments here in the book of Luke. However, before that, I wanted us to spend a couple of moments in Matthew. Matthew, Matthew 16, if you if you have a Bible, turn in the Bible, but if you don't, there's one in front of you. There should be next to the, the uh, hymn book that is there. Matthew 16 is important to, math, to, to Luke 15. How's that? How's that to, to kind of get your, your mind going, thinking, how can Matthew 16 be important to Luke 15? Well, because in Matthew 16, you have... Jesus interacting with a number of people, and the first thing that they do when they interact with him is to demand a sign. Now, what is a sign? It's not like a stop sign or a, or, or a go or you know, a, a signal light. They're thinking he's going to do a miracle. They want a miracle. And the fact is, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he had already done a lot of miracles. But the fact is they wanted more. They wanted more and more because they did not believe. They wanted him to qualify himself. They wanted him to, to legitimize himself. You know, there's, there's many times in our lives when we uh, are asked to do the same kind of thing. Uh, when, you, uh, need, when somebody needs to know if it's really you, what do they ask for? Identification. Identification. They ask for a, a driver's license. Or if you're my daughter right now, she's uh, traveling in the UK with four of her girlfriends, they want to see your passport. Uh, those of you who don't have a passport, you now know that, or you can now know because I'm going to tell you that in the front page, actually on the cover of your passport, is that little sign that says that embedded in your passport is an RFID chip. So your passport can actually be traced and, and, and you, you can be known simply by swiping your, your passport. That's your, your identification. It's becoming more and more important that we are identified. They ask Jesus, those that are around him, ask him to identify himself, show us your qualifications, show us your identification by doing a sign for us right now. Second thing that Jesus says he turns to his disciples and he says, look, be careful. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, uh, yeast is something that goes with bread, right? But what does the yeast do? Bakers, gentlemen, ladies, doesn't matter. If you know how to bake, it makes the bread rise. It expands the bread, okay? There's a chemical reaction. There is gas that blows bubbles inside of the dough. That's what releases, that's what raises the bread. It changes. This is the big point about yeast. It changes the bread and makes it into a different form and makes it actually edible. Jesus says, be careful of the changing perspective, the changing perspective of the Pharisees. Finally, he turns to his disciples in, in Matthew verse, chapter 16, he turns to his disciples and he says, now, who do you think that I am? And Peter gives that famous 
confession where he says, you are what? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says something very interesting to him right after that. He says, you did not hear this from humankind. I'm saying that instead of man, because that's what man in that context means. You did not hear this from somebody here on planet Earth. You heard this from my heavenly Father. He was the one who told you that I am the Christ and I am his son. He then tells them not to tell people about it, but before that he says, understand this. You are the one that I am going to build my church on. How many of you have read this text in Matthew 16? Okay, many people. And many people put an emphasis on that piece. Peter, you are the one. Is this what the text is saying? I want you to know that I have an emphasis coming that may change your mind just a little bit because of how Matthew 16 goes. Are you there with me in Matthew 16? Okay. Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by the Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I like the King James too. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let's do a little English for a moment. You have a definite article. You have a point in the sentence. And then you have that last little word, two letters long. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is the it? that Jesus is talking about. It's the church. The church is what Jesus builds upon the rock, and if you are worried that it is Peter, or if you're satisfied that it is Peter, please just skip down in your Bibles to verse 23, where Peter comes to Jesus, and he pulls him aside, and he rebukes him. Peter rebukes Jesus. Are you catching that? Peter rebukes Jesus and says, Never, Lord. Because what did Jesus do right after he tells them that I will build this rock, build this church upon this rock and the gates of Hades will not present? He says, And I will be killed. I'll be handed into the hands of the elders. This is verse 21. The elders and the chief priests and the teachers that he must be killed. This is talking about himself. He being himself, I'll be killed on the third day and be raised to life. This is now when Jesus starts telling his disciples what is going to happen in the future. And Peter takes him aside and says, Lord, that's not how the story is going to go. Maybe that's why I'm telling you the story today. Is because we get hung up on our own ideas. We get hung up on our own thoughts about how things should be. And I tell you what, in this very fast-changing world, it can cause you a lot of grief. Maybe some of you have heavy hearts even today because you don't like how the world is going. I was laughing with Danny here this morning in that one song where it says that we will gather people in from the fields of sin. Fields of sin. I said, Danny, that means that anywhere that is not here is a field of sin. Not sure that I'm happy with that. This is my father's world, is it not? Don't we sing that in another song? This is my father's world? Oh, let me ne'er forget. And we talk about all the wonderful things that are in the world. So maybe there are good things in this world and then there are fields of sin. Why am I saying this? I'm telling you this because we're talking about ideas. 
We're talking about ideas and we're basically saying, Jesus is basically saying, he is saying, the ideas that the Pharisees have, the idea that you have, Peter, about how things are going to go, are wrong. They're just wrong. Look at the strong words that he uses with Peter right then. Get thee behind me, Satan. So if you just had a feeling that in that other verse that we just read, in verse 18, where it says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build, and you thought that Peter was the rock, and a few verses later, he's telling Jesus, I don't think you're going to die and and be raised again. And Jesus turns around to him and says, you are speaking the words of the devil. Get away from me. In other words, Peter, what you have in your mind about how things are going to go is not the way that I am going. And if you are going to continue to think like that, you need to get away from me. I like the second half of verse 18, and you've heard it from me before. It's my favorite part. In fact, I've marked it in my Bible because it says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, will not prevail against it. You know me, I like to ask naughty questions. And I'm going to ask you that naughty question again today. Based on this text, I hope you're not too confused, but based on this text right now, where should the church be found? Let's read it again. I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I, Jesus says, I will build my church. Did did you notice the pronouns here? I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, will not prevail against it. The gates of hell. The gates of hell. So who is going through the gates of hell? You didn't ever think that the pastor would talk about going to hell. But I'm actually going to tell you. This text says that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who builds His church upon Himself, He says that we should go to hell. You don't believe me? You better get that Bible out. I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom when, where whatever you bind on earth will be bound on earth and whatever you uh, bind, whatever you loose, bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He is going to give us the power to do His will. He is going to give us the power to be part of His church and to go and knock on the doors of the hell that people are living in in this world right now. Oh, did you think that hell was coming later? So I heard this week there was a football team trapped in a cave. Are they out yet? They're not out. Do do you think they're worried about dying? Do you think it's scary? Yeah. Okay, so... There, there are at least a couple of doctors in the house. Uh, uh, when you go to see the doctor and he says, well, the, there's a possibility that that mole is malignant. Just that word, malignant. Do you know that it comes from the word malign? To malign means to, to think bad thoughts about someone, to say bad things about someone. So you now know that this mole is doing bad things to you. You don't like the word malignant. You get afraid because malignant means that it has intent. It's going to do something. 
So I want you to hear this verse this morning because it's very important for the story that we're going to look at in Luke 15. I want you to hear that Jesus is saying, I am going to build my church on me, and because the church is going to be powered by me, and, if, and, and when I send the church, where am I going to send the church? I'm going to send it into the fields of sin that we just sang about. I'm going to send it into the lives. I'm going to send you into the lives of people who are trapped in hell. Okay, so I think most of us know that most Americans today are in debt. If you didn't know that, now you do. Most Americans could not survive a month without pay. Very shocking. Actually something that if you're in the hearing of my voice, you should talk to Jesus about if that's you and understand that it is your responsibility as a Christian to put your financial affairs in order so that God can use you to help others. Now I just gave you your stewardship sermon for the year right there. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you do not have a financial platform from which to share the blessings of God, then I am going to dare say, sorry if I offend, but your financial picture does not match up with the kingdom of God. Being in debt, being in the house of debt, means that you cannot answer yes when the call comes to help because you're worried that you won't make it to next month. See how that works? So God asks you to manage what he gives you so that you can then be of assistance to others in his kingdom. Peter comes up to Jesus and says, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. I confess. There have probably been times in my life when I have not wanted what the Lord has to offer. I confess. Maybe I am not, at times, ready to accept that Jesus is coming soon. I don't know if you're young, but maybe you're thinking, Jesus, please don't come before I get married. Maybe you're thinking, please, Jesus, don't come before I... I you know. Do you know the only prayer that I pray right now about Jesus not coming? Is the one where I need more time. I need more time to tell the people that I love about Jesus with the hope that by telling them they will be interested in the salvation that he offers. I'm actually asking God for time to go into the hell that people are living in and ask them if they would like to come out. Famous text that, that Adventists know. We know that, come out of her, my people. Raise your hand if you've heard that one preached. What if we were to go into the hell of people's lives and say, come out of hell into the love that Jesus has to offer? Is that not what he is saying here? And I want you to know that he is also saying that it is a done deal. It's a finished operation. The mission has already been successful because Jesus has come into the hell of this world and he has been successful. And he said, if I am successful, you are going to be successful. You just trust me and go where I ask you to go and do what I ask you to do and you will be able to help others to no longer be living in the painful situations that they are living in. We, we, we could each stand, I'm sure, each adult here could stand and tell a story of either themselves or someone else who is in pain this week. 
I don't mean last week. I mean this week. You've heard the stories. Your friends have told you on Facebook or, or, or they've told you in person. You've had people cry on your shoulder. You know that there are lots of people that you know personally who you could say are in the painful grip of Hades. What are you going to do about it? Do you have anything in your mind? Do you have anything in your capability that is going to be able to help them? Now, for some, it might be that they, that they need a place to stay. I mean, look at Richard. Richard needs electricity right now. He'll be happy when Edison calls him with a, a real notice that his electricity is back on. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good is it for a man who, if he gains the whole world, yet he forfeits his soul? My friends, again, I emphasize, we are talking about ideas and Jesus says, beware of the yeast, beware of the changing ideas of the Pharisees. Peter, you have some of those changing ideas. Get away from me. This is how it's going to go. I'm going to die. I'm going to be resurrected. And that is how I'm going to save you. Oh, no, Lord, that's not how it's going to go. Yes, that's how it's going to go. And we say, to, we say this morning, praise God, that's how it's gone. Jesus said in John 14, if I go to my heavenly father, I'm going to prepare a place for you and that you can come and be with me. And that's if I get through. If I get through to the other side, he says, I will do this and I will do it for you. Guess what? He's gotten through. We celebrated that back in April with Easter, right? He is risen. Hallelujah. He's gotten through, which means the other half of the promise is going to happen. Everything else has happened. Everything else has come true. All that remains is that he comes back and takes us to live in his presence face to face Forever. Amen. Or should I say it like I like to say it? For the rest of forever. Because you see, today we're going to see a baptism. And this baptism is going to be because this young man has already made a decision to accept Jesus as his personal Savior. Just like when you get engaged. You say, sure, darling, I'll marry you. Then you're engaged. But then there's the wedding, which is telling everybody else, making a promise in front of everybody else, that you love each other and that you're going to stay together forever and ever. Well, that's what baptism is. You're doing this public thing that says, I'm going to be together with Jesus forever. Guess what? For John, who's going to get baptized in a little bit, his eternal life has already begun because he has accepted Jesus. He is together with Jesus. And anyone can have that. Anyone can be in that relationship with Jesus. And he says, you know what? Even if you die, we don't like that word, but he says, even if you die because I died and because I was resurrected, you may die, and you will be resurrected in the same way. That, my friends, is hope. I mean, what else do you have to tell people in this world that really matters, except that even if you die, yet you will live again? Is that not the best news ever? It's the best news. We live in the valley of the shadow of death. We need that kind of news. All right, let's turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 has three stories in it. I'm only going to be looking at story number two. 
Story number one is the lost sheep. Quickly tell it to me. Man has a hundred sheep. What does he do? One gets lost. Do you notice what he does? Do you, I, I can't help this. Do you notice what he does? He leaves the 99 in the... Are you reading it? He doesn't leave them in the sheep pen. He leaves them in the field, in the open field. I hope he had an assistant, or at least a good German shepherd, or a sheepdog of some kind. But he leaves them in the open field. Are you kidding me? He is more intent on finding that one lost sheep than the rest of the 99 that are in the open field hopefully being guarded by the dog. I want you to see that. Because he, as, as, as some have said, is the hound of heaven. He is going to look for that sheep until he finds it. And then when he finds it, what happens? Hey, big time rejoicing. So ladies, this is your story. Number two, story number two, Jesus says, or suppose, this is verse 8 of, John, of Luke chapter 15, or suppose a woman has ten coins. Now, Mrs. Thornburg has a very nice necklace on this morning that I thanked her for wearing. And if you want to see it, have her show it to you afterwards. But it is very much like the kind of jewelry that we're talking about here in this text. It is the kind of jewelry that would have coins attached to it. And if you've seen those Middle Eastern ladies' garb, specifically when they get married, they often have coins put on the sides of their headdress and down, all the way down. These, my friends, were real and they were her dowry. They were the money that belonged to her as a daughter of her father, and he gave her this money to go into her marriage with. It was not her husband's money. It was her money. So you can now invest this story with that kind of importance. It was one of those ten coins in the story the ones that her father gave her when she got married, that she lost. Now, nine is just not as good as ten. And when they are the special ones that your father gave you on your wedding day, you are not wanting to lose. So what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say as he's telling us this story? Does she not? Now, he's He's assuming, he's assuming that people know exactly what he's talking about and that when he tells this story, they are going to relate to this information like, duh, of course. Okay, so he says, does she not light a lamp, best source of light that she has, you know, nowadays it would probably be a halogen bulb or something. Does she not light a lamp sweep the house, we'd probably use a vacuum cleaner, and then we'd check the, the contents afterwards, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost coin. And he says, In the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God, over one sinner that repents. And I'm going to just go to the punchline right now and say, heaven is bent on making sure that we all get there. Heaven wants us home. And when we participate, when we participate in helping others to know about how heaven feels about us, we are on the same page with Jesus. Okay. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware of those who are interested in you being like them more than they're interested in pointing you to Jesus. Beware of anyone <clears throat> who says, oh, you know, 
You shouldn't bother those people over there. You know, they're, they're fine. It's, you know, let, just, just let them be. You know, uh, 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 beware. Beware of those individuals who have an idea of how our world is today that says, oh, don't, don't worry. Don't worry about them. They'll be fine. That's not the idea that comes from heaven. That's not the idea that comes from Jesus. Jesus, Jesus says, I have come to seek and save the lost. He is the woman in the story. The church needs to be the woman in this story. She diligently, the Bible says, she doesn't stop until she finds the coin. She is willing. I don't know how you like to interpret this, but it, 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 it's pretty radical stuff. She is willing to turn her house upside down. Are we, are we willing to turn our lives? Are we willing to turn our church upside down to seek and save, to be part of of what VBS is going to be about this year. The rescue plan. To be part of the rescue of humanity. We're going to do a VBS and, and it's going to be all about the rescue plan that Jesus has in mind for every boy and girl, mom, dad, uncle, everybody on planet Earth is invited but they're going to need to be rescued because they're trapped. They're trapped in their minds. Their minds believe certain things that are just not true. And Jesus has said, I'm going in there. I'm going in there and the gates of hell will not be able to keep me out. Are you coming, church? Are you coming? So next time I ask you that naughty little question, I am expecting that you will know the answer. Where should the church be found today? Two words. In hell. In hell. In the hell of people's lives who are without Jesus. We... We show, my friends, we show that we are interested in, in, the, in the plan that Jesus has to save humanity when we get involved in other people's lives on the page where Jesus lives. If we do that, we show that he is our leader and that we are doing his bidding. Okay, these Bibles, there's only five left. These are people that are sitting incarcerated, okay? Okay. These are, would you say mainly ladies? We get both. Ladies and gentlemen who have had something happen to them in their lives or that they have believed something and that because they believed something, they went and did something and it was illegal and they got caught. And the justice system said, you go to jail when you do this and you, you, you did the crime, now you have to do the time. And they've got time now. They've got time to say, you know what? I don't, want to, I don't want to live like that anymore. They get a new idea in their head. And guess what? This book, this Bible, helps them to understand Jesus' way of thinking, Jesus' perspective. So I say, as church people, we should know that perspective. Does that not stand to reason? We should know the perspective of Jesus about humanity and that we should be interested in helping him. John, where are you? Come on up, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, this is John Moreau. And he is a student in the area. Let's see, what else do you do, John? Are you going to be a rocket scientist or what are you going to be? He's not sure what he's going to be yet. God's still working with him. I, I told him, you know, there was a possibility of 
of a beach vespers where we could do a beach baptism. And he said, well, uh, going to be having a little, little operation, so needs to happen before then. So I said, no problem. Then I went to Norm, and Norm said, you know, our, our baptistry leaks. I said, well, can we get it fixed? Well, I don't know. So I said, don't worry, Norm, I have another way. And then I didn't, didn't really know that it would be 106 today. So I have water for you if you're worried. There's water over there. But in a moment, after we have a prayer for John here, and after we go into a quick business session and uh, make a vote about accepting him into membership, I'm going to ask you to come around the side of the church and into Oak Courtyard, which is behind our Sabbath school wing there, and I want you to stand and watch while I baptize John in a horse trough. Every, uh, all the cowboys are going, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Pick me next. <laughs> We're going to do this under the water. I, I'm going to put him all the way under the water because it signifies that John has chosen the life that Jesus would have him live. Okay? Those of you who have done this already, I want, to, I, I want to say, God bless you, and the Holy Spirit is trying to help you keep your vow. Those of you who have not made that decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, it is now that you need to do that because you don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. And I'm not trying to make you scared. I'm just stating facts. I don't know about tomorrow. You don't know about tomorrow. So don't say, oh, I'll, I'll become a Christian someday. Today's the day. Talk to me if you want to do what John is going to do today. Talk to me about that because I know that there are some of you who are struggling in the valley of decision as to whether or not you want to be a Christian. Maybe you're saying, I want to be a Christian, but I'm not so sure about the Adventist church. Well, guess what? We've got some studies going on, right, Denise? We've got some studies going on beginning next Sabbath that can help you understand a little bit more about how we see the Bible and how we see Jesus. Take the opportunity. Push everything out of the way because I guarantee you there's going to be stuff that's going to come up that's going to try to keep you from coming to those studies. Push it out of the way. Give Jesus space in your life to tell you about himself so that you can be like John on the same page with Jesus and his perspective about this life and the next. As a the pastor of this church, I'm not the board chair, Milt Hinkle is the board chair, but I'm kind of co-chair with him. As the pastor of this church, I'd like to ask if there is a motion to accept John into membership subject to his baptism. Is there a second? There's a second. All in favor as the members of this church of having John become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Santa Clarita, would you raise your hand? There it is, John. Any opposed? It is carried. Welcome, John. That's called the right hand of fellowship right there. Okay. And anyone else on the way out, uh, John is going to come this way. Uh, I, I'm going to have uh, Lee. See, he's all, man, you're on the job. Thank you so much. Lee is going to play a little something. It's not going to be anything that we're going to sing because we're going to sing a hymn after the baptism over there. Please don't rush away. Please come honor God, honor John uh, with his decision to be baptized and uh, join us in Oak Courtyard at this time. Okay, there's a song sheet in your, uh, in your bulletin, so bring it out there and you will have the music. Okay, let's, let's go there. John, you're going to go back this way. Milton? Uh, okay. okay, they'll take care of you. All right. Follow me.
we elected to uh, to use our theatrical voices today. Um, want to say thank you very much to our leadership for making this possible, and um, and for John. John, you uh, you said yes to my wacky idea here, and uh, I, I got you I got you a trough just your size. Okay. <laughs> And, and no, I'm, I'm not getting in. John, because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and your desire to be a part of his eternal kingdom, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song real quick, right underneath here. has shown how when we accept you, we can begin again, we can be clean, we can start a new life, a life of eternity. Father, we just ask that you would protect John, that you would make him strong in the faith, and that one day, very soon, that you would find him and all of us ready to meet you in the clouds of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and amen like to invite you to the uh, wed uh, the baptism supper, uh, I mean the baptism lunch. <laughs> I was thinking the wedding supper of the Lamb, but we have lunch prepared right through those doors right there. Please turn right around and find yourself a seat. We have lots of food. Thank you for coming, and God bless you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
If anyone wants to shake, if anyone wants to shake John's hand, come on and do it. Good job. He's fine. Are you okay?